there's like the Los Angeles Times, you know, Los Angeles Times um, book event every year. Well, not last year, maybe not this year, but it's a huge, huge event. Usually in March or April, it usually seems to happen when I'm jet lagged, um, flying back from spring break. And um, the Festival of Books, I feel like this is on the west side, now moved to USC. And it's this huge outdoor festival with tents and different writers and publishers signing books. And yet, there we were. And, um, but the one that she remembers that I remember is the, probably the last one we did together, which was um, the Studio City Public Library. So Studio City is a, a subsection, a little area in uh, Los Angeles. And um, so there's 50, last time, maybe 51 branches of the Los Angeles Public Library. And I will do a talk at any of them and I ask. And whenever they ask, I always say yes, unless I'm out of town. And uh, Emily Aronson um, now is the adult librarian who coordinates these uh, events. Um, so I do both crime writer events and romance events. Um, I don't, I'm not really writing romance right now, so mainly crime events. But two or three years ago, there was a romance uh, writer event. And I don't know, it was me, Mia Hopkins, Jen LeBlanc. Oh my God. Uh, a really famous <laughs> author who I can see, and I can only remember her real name, so I can't say her real name. Um, but she has a writing name, I just can't think of it. And uh, um, maybe like a fifth author, I just don't remember what I remember. And um, actually, Jen LeBlanc, who's an author, posted this recently because I think it came up as a memory on her Facebook timeline. Somebody who was fairly famous was standing in the back and she asked, oh, maybe she's a famous person's mother, um, somebody who's on TV right now. And I think she announced who she was and whose mom or daughter she was. I think she was somebody's mom. And she starts to ask about what it's like writing sex. But like, rather than the usual sort of prairie and ha question of um, how do you get your ideas for your books or how do you write sex scenes for your books or do you practice them? All these inappropriate questions I've been asked many times. Um, she asked that and then I don't know who or how anyone answered and she then like asked more detailed questions like to the point where everybody's sitting around it got really quiet in the room <laughs> and nobody knew what to say because what do you it's like well what do you do and if this, it's this position and have you practiced this and like you know it was just one of those moments where you're like wow this has gone too far somebody needs to rein it in um so i believe emily was like next question or we're done for the day or let's have some cookies do you want some cookies we're giving away swag we're having a raffle who knows what happened but we totally totally uh <laughs> sidestepped that but it was just it was the most awkward moment, and I think I was sitting next to Mia, and I was looking at her cowboy covers, you know, and I was just like, okay, well, that happened. <laughs> um, there's nothing else we can do. That happened. Um, but she's a delightful writer, so the East Library books are what sort of um, caught my attention. So as we talked about in the podcast, um, Sue Grimshaw was a buyer at Borders um, before that imploded for years, but she was like an enthusiastic romance buyer. There are buyers for other uh, retailers who were less enthusiastic about romance, let's just say that. But she sort of loved the genre and people loved talking to her about it because she read the books that she bought and, went and recommended for the chain. So when Borders imploded, um, I guess people went different places, but 
ultimately she turned up um, at um, Random House, which I guess is now Penguin Random House. I'm sorry, we call it the Randy Penguin as a joke, and I have to think about the real name. She turned up at Penguin Random House, and at that point they opened a new imprint. So publishing houses open and close new imprints all the time. It's especially true for genre is for genre writing so like romance and crime fantasy they come they go they come they go but um when somebody good comes you want to be published by them it happens all the time somebody who's like really well known in a genre like open an imprint everybody's like yay somebody who actually loves the books is editing and acquiring you know we all rush over there so love swept um so sue grimshaw was tapped to run love swept and what I really liked about the book. So I read a number of them for the RWA Rita contest, which is now also gone and now called the Vivian. But it was sort of the best of the romance genre uh, contest. And um, as public published authors, you would read entries and grade them. And then there would be a finals and whatever, a whole awards thing. I talked about it on a previous podcast um, with Evelyn Adams, which I think is episode 11. And it was one of the first books I read was a Molly O'Keefe book. It was one of the first books that came out with Love Swept and I was enchanted. Um, And then she also published, oh, I should have looked this up. There's a book called The Story Guy. I cannot think of the author off the top of my head, but that was like another thing that was published by Love Swept and they were just so different like they were sort of transgressive of the genre of the romance genre but really 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 good and it was like oh look sue brought her good eye she's like looking through these things and she's publishing things that are a little bit out of the box because before the revolution of self-publishing and before the last 10 years romance was fairly rigid in in publication so around the margins things would be published that had either like characters of color or people who had disabilities or just even like um uh gay romance was still like not mainstream and it was so amazing to watch stories that would otherwise not have been published being published by an imprint from a mainstream big five publisher and she had such a good eye and and edited them well and they were just so good um and another author that we were talking about um a friend of mine named beth yarnell also was published by sue we she was published by a lot of people (laughs) including sam hayden as well but she was also published by sue but i loved the books that um the beth yarnell books that sue acquired they were just so good and so I really sort of, so Love Swept, um, as imprints do, they come and they go. Um, I don't know, maybe it was around five years. I don't even know it was that long. Um, and then they closed and who knows what's replaced it now. I don't keep up with stuff like this as much as I used to. But so Mia came out of that little period. And one of the things I liked about it is that um, in her books, The Hero and Heroine were... Um, latinx hispanic whatever you want to call it but also just it was such a different story like you know he was this guy and he got out of prison and he's like facing all the challenges of people who are you know come out of prison and you know recidivism is a real thing and people staying out and then going back um as a criminal defense attorney i encountered it all the time and so i knew of those people i worked with those people but I had never read about those people in a way that wasn't either a sociological study or some like crime fiction where, you know, they're either wrongly imprisoned or the person who should have been imprisoned is, you know, running around on a spree of killing or whatever, got away with it for years. And it's a cold case investigation. I mean, I've read so many of those books, but that is more about what a person does. And these books were about what a person feels and what it feels like to try to avoid going back to jail and what it's like to try to work um, when you have a felony conviction. And what was so interesting is that um, her characters lived on the east side of Los Angeles, um, but were working on the west side and what it's like to take a bus all the way across town. I mean, I don't take buses in Los Angeles. I never have, but I mean, driving across town, I did it recently because the traffic is back. And 
it's like, you know, it's a lot. And I thought, I didn't even know I was driving 35 minutes in my car to go, you know, eight miles. And sometimes I think the ridiculousness of it. But, you know, I'm in a nice car. I have like, you know, my podcast. I have my phone plugged in. I can listen to audiobooks. You know, it's not, I talk to people on the phone. Like, it's not an unpleasant thing. But I don't have to catch a bus to get somewhere on time. And those are real time pressures and real issues that people face in order to like maintain employment. And it's not a small thing. And I really like the fact that she covered some of these things that are not small things that they're not insurmountable, but it's certainly like a roadblock in the way to living like a fulfilling life or getting your life back on track or any of those things. And we live in a society that sort of really puts a lot of, well, we call it personal responsibility, but the other side of that is sometimes blame. And, you know, well, why can't people keep jobs, get jobs, do whatever? And I'm like, you know, people are traveling on a bus for two hours for a minimum wage job and buses are not perfect. And, you know, they break down. I see them sometimes broken down on the side of the road. And I thought, these people didn't get to work on time. Um, So it's a real thing. And public transportation in Los Angeles is not efficient for me. I don't know. I grew up in New York City. So, you know, (laughs) to me, efficient public transportation was a completely different sort of animal. And the fact that like people take buses here and it takes forever just boggles my mind. So her writing about those real things like totally sucked me in and um it was just amazing so I did a thing that I don't always do um but I have a friend who does it and I was like I would like to know more about Mia and I want her to write more books and all of this so I'm just gonna like befriend her and hang out and you know do anything I can to help her produce more books because I think the world needs more stories of the kind of stories that she's trying she's trying that she writes that she I don't know I didn't say that right but um I will say this so I never did read her cowboy books I do talk about that um a little bit in the interview um just because like there's a lot of there are a lot of sort of trope things like cops or navy seals or billionaires or vampires I don't know there's a lot of hero um sort of stock hero ideas and um some of them are not my cup of tea um my cup of tea is usually beta heroes friends to lovers i have a different sort of sensibility so i've known her to write these cowboy books all these years and i never thought about it because there's somebody else who writes cowboy books and it was all about i don't know something and i was like i don't know what that's about but it seems like a thing i'm not going to read about but after she talks in this interview about like the Central Valley and all that, I'm really intrigued because it sounds like these books have a sense of place. And I live in California and I know nothing about anything outside of, to be honest, San Diego, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. After that, you know, I visited a lot of them for a day or two or a week, but I don't have a great California knowledge. I didn't grow up here, so it's just, it is what it is. I have a great East Coast knowledge, a great New England knowledge, not a great California knowledge. And so I want to read these for a sense of place, but I can't uh, recommend her books highly enough. I suggest you go out right now and get them. (laughs) Um, If you read romance, they are delightful. Um, And she has a lovely daughter whom I adore. She's so, so, so super cute. So here we are, um, get ready for a lovely, lovely and delightful chat with uh, Mia Hopkins. Hi, this is Amy Austin and welcome to A Time to Thrill. This month, I'm so excited. So I am interviewing uh, Mia Hopkins. Say hi, Mia. Hi, Not. everyone. <laughs> um, so Mia, okay, I will tell you all about her later when I do the intro, but it's so good to have you. How are you? I'm doing okay. How are you? <laughs> eh, you know, I've been in my house a year, but I'm fully vaccinated, so Yay. I'm super, super excited about that. I was finally able to get um, an appointment for my first dose next week, and mm. then I saw, <laughs> I was so proud of myself, and then I saw online that like our city is opening it up today to everyone. I'm like, damn it. But <laughs> yeah. I'm so happy to be getting that first dose. Um, and it's a Moderna one. And I'm a big Dolly Parton fan, so I'm happy to receive it. 
I will only say this, and I don't know why I'm saying this online, but the the fatigue is no joke. And I didn't, the first time I didn't see it coming and I couldn't understand why I couldn't get off my couch at seven at night. Um, so the second time I took a second day off um, so that mm-hmm. I could just be tired and not feel obligated to do something because I was just so tired. Oh man. I've heard that the fatigue is really strong. Some people get a, like a mild fever. Mm-hmm. Um, I tried to get an appointment late in the day so I could just conk out. <laughs> right. Yes. That's a um, good idea. <laughs> I did my first one at 7 a.m. Don't do oh, that. No. <laughs> you just kind of be <laughs> underwater all day like, eh, what's going on? <laughs> yeah. Totally. But I remember like, um, you know, like I have a daughter, she's uh, almost three, but I remember her getting all these shots, you know, when, when she was a baby and she's kind of stone cold, you know, like she would just, mm-hmm. she would just take, and the nurses would be surprised. Like she's not crying. Is she okay? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, she's <laughs> fine. This is how she gets shots. And like, I recently had to have a shot and I was like, wow, <laughs> this hurts. Ew. I'm in the face. I'm like, man, my kid is stone cold. What is this? No, I was actually just thinking about this. So the last time my son got a shot was maybe eight. I don't know. I, I can't remember because it's hard, you know, to remember. But I know that we were like in Budapest because I do a lot of his shots in Europe because mm-hmm. I like it better. And all I remember is he got the shot. He got a lollipop. He lost the balloon 14 seconds after we left the doctor's office. And then like <laughs> we got on the tram. But I was trying to I was actually trying to think, has he ever been tired or did I just ignore it or did I not think about it? And I was I'm sorry. I'm having a parenting moment where I thought, oh, maybe he's been tired and I just never noticed mm-hmm. um, because, you know, he's so high energy or because he used to go to bed at seven. Like, I just don't know. So I feel like going forward, because I think he has to get a couple shots before you enter, he enters middle school in a year. Mm-hmm. I'm going to like be a little more sensitive <laughs> to, to the like, uh, How are you feeling? Are exactly. you dizzy at all? Are you okay? Exactly. <laughs> Like, I'm fine, I, mom. Bonk. I know exactly. So, but I, I just realized I was like, I've just, I wasn't thinking too deeply about it. It was just the thing we did, and you know, I was like, does he get the lollipop or does he get the balloon? And when are we gonna get home? Mm-hmm. And you know, mm-hmm. like the logistics of it, not how he actually felt. So, I mean, they do have a waiting period in Europe, which is why I like it better because they do have like a the thing they're doing with COVID where they have you wait. They mm-hmm. did, um, they do in Europe, so they have you wait, and then they give you like all the information about the like. That, what shot you got and you know mm-hmm. the lot number and all that and they wait for a reaction and they call you the next day and so I really like that which is why I do oh, it that's there nice. no it's yeah. great and it makes me feel better um but to say that but as a parent I've been lax so sorry about this <laughs> <laughs> the side You're just like we got you it's okay I, exactly <laughs> like we got you you can just lay down and parent um <laughs> sorry I just felt so I was just laying on the couch and I just felt so horrible I was like oh there's a parenting thing I clearly missed um mm-hmm. But he's alive and well. So how yes. are you? Um, so I will say this. I adore your child. Um, oh, yay. She know, adores you too. She's like one of my favorites. So it's weird sort of. So I'll say this. Um, oh, let me go back. I have so many questions for you, but let me start with this. So you used to write for Love Swept. Um, and I came upon Thirsty at the same time that um, I don't know. I'm sure you know Beth Yarnell was writing for Love mm-hmm. Swift as well. And one mm-hmm. of the things I really liked that Sue had been doing at that time was acquiring books that were sort of, I don't want to say non traditional because that's not fair, but outside of the kind of romance books I grew up with. Um, right. And so Beth writes those kinds of books, which is what I love about her books. I love Beth. Yeah. I know. I love and her work. I so do I so much. And so when your book came out, it had that sort of similar feel in the sense that it was about people I normally would not read about in romance, but that I think about in real life. Mm. And so that's, it really like struck me. So I read Thirsty. I recommended it, I'm sure to 9,000 people. I'm like, you've got to read this <laughs> book. So no, because it's so much, it was, it was what I want. It's, it's what I want in romance. Like, so I write and some of the romance I write, and I'm getting away from romance for a whole host of reasons, but some of the romance I write, I like non-traditional characters. So they don't have to bake cupcakes. No offense to the cupcake, because I know you bake, but you know what I mean? Like they don't, the women, <laughs> the women don't have to bake cupcakes. The men don't have to be billionaires or perfect or whatever. And I love the mm-hmm. people falling in love with other people who are imperfect, more openly imperfect than, you know, um, I mean, because everybody has flaws, but more openly and perfect. So I have so many questions. So how did you come to write that book? Because I love it so deeply. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. 
It was a pro- it was actually a NaNoWriMo project, if you can believe that. Wow. I, yeah, I started writing novels years and years ago when a friend of mine told me about National Novel Writing Month, November. Where you write, is it, oh man, I can't even remember, is it 50,000 words? Yeah, it's 50,000 yeah. in a month, which I think is about 1,600 a day, because that's about the pace I write, really, in real life. It's a great, it, it's a great pace, but, you know, like, I always wanted to write a book. I always wanted to try but I never knew the physical requirements of sitting down and writing a book. Like how, how does it feel to sit down and just write something all the way through of that length? Um, that wasn't a research paper. That right. wasn't, you know, like a, an assignment for work. So having the opportunity, you know, for fun, for a hobby to sit down and write a book all the way through, like that's how I fell in love with writing novels was, was that. Mm-hmm. And so a couple years ago, NaNoWriMo came along again, and I thought, hey, let me just work on something totally different from what I had been doing before. I was writing a lot of cowboys. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the time, I had left. I was a classroom teacher for a lot. I was a classroom teacher for 13 years. Okay. And I had recently left the classroom and was like in a, trans- a transition in mm-hmm. my in my life where I'm trying to get used to the idea that yes I'm I'm actually selling work as a fiction writer like this is crazy right. and um, like I'd never done anything like that before like I had no hustle at all like I was a teacher and so <laughs> like kind of falling headfirst into a different way of thinking about work and thinking about your identity and thinking about yourself I wanted to find a way to still be connected to people because writing can be really isolating. So much. So isolating. And especially this year. And Mm -hmm. so at the time, um, like I taught in Catholic schools here in LA, I was uh, impressed whenever um, representatives from the organization Homeboy Industries came to talk at our school. Mm -hmm. And they're a gang intervention program here in LA that helps recently... um, formerly incarcerated people find work, find therapy, find housing. It's kind of a one-stop shop. They've right. been in operation for years and years. Um, there's lots of uh, different social initiatives they have. They have a, a job training program on site, a bakery, a restaurant, screen printing uh, business, all kinds of different uh, job training available for people who have been released from prison and have um, had difficulties. And so I volunteered there and I said, well, you know, like I have teaching experience, maybe I can help in the education program, I can be a tutor. And the woman said, well, what are you doing now? And I said, well, I'm, I'm writing fiction. And she's like, you know what, I think you might be uh, the right volunteer for something we need in the development department. And I'm like, oh, what's that? You know. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, well, basically, you're going to come in and you're going to talk to clients and trainees about their experiences with Homeboy, record their stories, write them down and present them in, on our website and on our marketing materials because we're looking for more donors. And this is a great way to connect with donors is to give a human face to the people who are affected by our program. Wow. And I was like, well, I guess I could do that. You're like, <laughs> sure, I'll sit down and talk to people. And I, you know, I love listening to stories. I think so most much. writers, yeah, <laughs> I will it. sit down and listen to people's stories all the time. But like, I'm pretty introverted. And so like my husband was a newspaper reporter for a long time. Like he could talk to a tree. <laughs> Everyone wants to talk to him. We'll go on, like we used to go on road trips and they would take twice as long because he'd stop and be like, hey, this person wants to talk to us about their life. And I'd be like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like they would invite him like we go to just stop for lunch and then like the old lady who owns the barbecue restaurant would be like hi son how are you doing today let me tell you about my life and then all of a sudden we're standing next to the pit talking to her husband and her kids and her dog and it's like wow. I wish I had that skill you know mm-hmm. but um back to homeboy <laughs> the job was really neat it was a volunteer position but I got to sit down with trainees who had um who are in different like stages in their progress in the okay. program. Mm-hmm. And I just heard so many incredible stories. Like I just got to sit with people for hours and just have them open up like to a stranger and tell me about these incredible lives where such terrible things happened, but they were clawing their way back. And every day was a struggle, especially when trainees were recovering from addiction, right. um, like, incredible trauma, Mm -hmm. early trauma. It was eye-opening and, you know, I grew up here, but I feel like 
because of my upbringing, I was really sheltered. Mm -hmm. Um, And so hearing stories like that haven't been filtered through any kind of like media, (laughs) like it was incredible. And I thought like, these people are heroic. Like you're a hero for being alive, number one. Number two, for turning it around. Number three, for trying to take care of your family when people want nothing to do with you. Right. And so it became a genesis for like this character, Sal, Mm -hmm. who is like a a combination of a lot of different people, a lot of different stories that I heard while I was working at Homeboy. And the more and more I thought about this character, the more and more like I had to write him down and I had to write him down in his voice. And so that became my NaNoWriMo project because I was like, well, why not? Let me Mm -hmm. see if I can do this. And he slowly started to take shape. Um, and then he wouldn't shut up. And that was it. Yeah. I know. <laughs> and I love there. that moment. Oh, man. I love it when the characters won't shut up. It's so great. <laughs> it is. I'm going to be honest. It is. It is. It's very um, – I don't know how my, – my son describes it weirdly because he's like uh, – it. they take over. I don't even know how to say it because it seems crazy when I hear it myself. <laughs> it's very It's very woo-woo, isn't it? Yes. It? Yeah, it is. <laughs> so I'll step away. So what – so what? So when you finished the book, what made you think about selling it, or what? How did you decide? Like, I don't know how you submitted, or if you had an agent or something. But what made you have the wherewithal to submit it? When, in my experience, and you're younger than me, um, editors generally were not looking for that kind of thing. No, I didn't think anyone was, <laughs> and that's why it was kind of freeing to take it on as a project because I had originally published with. Uh, independent presses and Mm -hmm. so I was fresh off kind of like a sad experience with Sam Hain Mm -hmm. who were fantastic to me and you know like they published my first three books like in quick succession I loved my editor Jennifer Haymor she's amazing yeah I love her I haven't thought about her yeah so great yeah and so we had done that project together and then they shut like just a few months after signing me and I was like my publishing dreams went up in smoke all of a sudden. But it was a good lesson to learn early on, right? Yes, because they come in, at least romance imprints come and go faster and faster, it seems. Um, I know. And it was so like, oh, man, I had had other offers from independent presses for my work. And I was like, but Sam Haynes has been around a long time. Let me sign with them. Right. And then it just shut. Um, I was able to get my rights back pretty quickly, I think, because I was, you know, I was new. They mm-hmm. had all the paperwork on the top of the pile. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I indie, you know, I indie published those and then two other books in the series. And so I was like, well, why not? Let me go ahead and, and self-publish Thirsty 2 and mm-hmm. see if I can get another series going. Uh, maybe somebody will buy it. Maybe. Right. I don't know. Readers might like this. Uh, so I gave it to Jennifer. She looked it over. And she said, you know what? I think Sue might be interested in this. Can I share this with her? Mm-hmm. And I was like, Sue? <laughs> I know. Sue is kind of legendary, but that's a different conversation. Yeah. Right. And so that was a, gosh, when was that? 2016, maybe? 2015? Okay. It was a while ago. And um, yeah, so she handed it over. And it was um, like around the time of different conferences and I was you know querying and trying to see if I could get an agent Mm -hmm. and you know um there were a couple of um hashtag agent events on Twitter that I participated in and got you know um some requests and so Sue was really interested in in buying it and buying the series and from that point on the paperwork went really quickly but I was I was nervous about signing with a large publisher right? just because I was really green. And so um, I had gotten some interest at uh, the night agency for a presentation. And so I told them about how Love Swept was interested with (laughs) it all. Like, it seems like dominoes, doesn't it? Like they all just started falling. And so I said, you know, like they're really interested in buying the series. I really want an agent to be by my side while I make this, you know, while I sign this contract. And then like all of a sudden I was agented and I had a big five contract, like in a, in a flash after working (laughs) so long, trying to get people interested in my work. Like it happened one, two, three on a project that I didn't think anyone would, would buy Mm -hmm. really. So yeah, that's how it happened. That's how my work got to 
Love Swept. Okay. Which is a different chapter. <laughs> I know. Because so I will, uh, not to editorialize, but Love Swept also as a um, as an imprint closed ooh, two years ago. I'm sorry, like 2020 is gone. So I don't know anymore. Yeah, two, it doesn't two exist. I, yeah. yeah. Time is time is very fluid right now. It is. Um, and that was uh, unfortunate because so Sue Grimshaw, oh, I don't want to go into the whole thing, but she used to be a buyer for... Oh my God. Is it Borders? God, it was cool. Borders. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she was well known as a lover of romance and a promoter of romance. And so when she went in house as an editor with Love Swap, which was a branch of Penguin Random House, it was a huge deal. And she was acquiring work. She had a, a different sort of sense um, about mm-hmm. romance and she was acquiring work that I really loved. I mean, like there was so many like it was like Molly O'Keefe and like all of these people. Mm, oh, yeah. Yeah. Ooh. In the beginning when she, yeah. So I think, and I read all those for like when I was doing reader, 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 reading, excuse me. And mm-hmm. so I thought she has a great eye or I guess a great eye or a great sense. And she brought that to acquisition for romance. And so it was a huge deal and it was really interesting. And I think she acquired some really great books and promoted some really great authors who may not have otherwise had as great of success um, in the narrow confines of how romance was published traditionally. I'll say that. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. that um, for you to, it it makes sense. Like in my head, it makes sense. Like, you know, you being acquired by Sue makes a lot of sense. Um, And I really love that period, the love swept period from like the beginning, um, which I feel like, God, I don't know, maybe 2014. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. Something like that. I remember because my son was little or um, re- trying to read, you know, while I'm reading books while he's spinning around, but doing that. And then up until it, it closed, but it was a, it's like, a, it's a little golden period that I, I really enjoyed. Um, and oh, I'm, man. I really, really was happy about that. But publishing is like, <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of, I mean, it's sort of like TV, actually. I mean, live in LA, it's kind of fickle. So, you know, yeah. it's, it's great. And then it's, you know, comes and goes. So it's, it's in waves. Um, and we all get swept along in the meantime. I mean, I've had the many imprints close <laughs> on me and oh, it's yeah. fine. It's fine. I got over it. Um but I think it's an important lesson, especially if you're starting out as a writer, is that you're trying to build a body of work, right? right. You're yes. not trying to, it's not all reliant on one book, one publisher. It's not a one shot deal. It's, it's you, you're right. the, you're the, you're the treasure chest, you right. know? So, you know, carry that with you from house to house, indie pub to book to indie pub book. Like it's always going to be there. Nothing's going to change that. I think that's so very true, but I still know, like I was just on Zoom earlier with some authors and Mm -hmm. a lot of the authors I know who are traditionally published, especially by Harlequin um, 10 to 15 years ago, Mm -hmm. um, have had some difficulty with that transition because there was a certain sort of way that publishers, it was like you'd write like a series book and then maybe you'd write like a standalone that they would write, you know, that they would um, advertise in a different way. And then maybe you'd move into women's fiction. So there was a sort of um, odd pipeline that people would go through um, to get the success that people generally would want in that kind of industry. And it, it was upended by indie. Um, it changed a lot. It was upended by ebooks. There were so many things that categorically changed in the last mm-hmm. decade. But, and so authors have to be a little more, I don't know, that's self sustaining. That's not the word I want, but it's you. It's not so much Random House or, you know, Harper's. It's more you. Um, but it's like every single like Sam Hain got me to love swept got me to right, right. now <laughs> nowhere in particular but um, a lot of readers right. that was such a great thing about working with love swept right before I wasn't working with love swept <laughs> is that they were able to get me so many more new readers that I would never ever be able to reach as an indie that's true and that's so true. it was it was an incredible platform um when thirsty came out and then later when I um indie pub trashed mm-hmm. it was a great help yeah yeah no um so anyway I, I do love that book and I do like I I'm actually the homeboy thing is fascinating because that's I love like the thing I love about, I love meeting people and talking to them and getting their stories. And I was actually talking to my son about that because he likes it as well, but it sometimes can get you into trouble. We were talking about that because he was like, people think I want to be their friend. And he's like, I just want to hear their story. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, I have the same issue. Um, 
Yeah, so we're, we're, we're talking about, because he's like 11, we're talking about how to navigate that. Um, so I have a question. For how did you get into writing the cowboy book? So my recollection of, I don't know when I met you, because that's kind of hard, but I remember being at author events where you were there. And at the time, it was just the cowboy books. So like we were at like either, I feel like either an LA Times book signing or like the Studio City um, library thing. Oh, right. Yeah. I, I, I remember that we were at a lot of events together, but I think the first time we actually had a conversation was at the at a library panel okay. for romance was oh. Studio City. Okay. And I remember that that panel was so much fun. It was. So Jen LeBlanc, who's an author, put that together. I don't know why, but I you don't I don't know if you know Emily. So Emily Aronson is the well, the librarian for that branch and it used to be somebody else but um but I used to live over there and I used to go to that branch all of the time and I think she has such a love of authors and puts together some really great events because I also go to crime writer events as well Mm -hmm. Um, it's so great when you have somebody like in your actual community who's active and like really helping to promote authors it makes such a great difference it does and there's actually you know do you know Catherine Royalty well we'll talk about it some other time but she's also um, at the LA library and so she does events well in the, not this year, but she does events for authors as well. And obviously, like, people in libraries love books, but it's so – libraries are my favorite, so it's so lovely to work with people who, like, love books and authors and then also put together events where you can reach community members you otherwise wouldn't have with those. Right. They understand that one of the best things about reading is talking about reading to other people. <laughs> like, that's all we want to do is be like, listen, have you read this book? We have to talk about it. We have it. to talk yeah. about it. Exactly. So you do. And- join in. Let's all talk about it. Yeah. I, I do love it. Um, and she also makes, <laughs> and like uh, Emily actually makes cookies that are like match the events. It's so cute. Oh my gosh. I know. Right. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it so much. Um, so anyway, so how is it that you started writing cowboy books? Because that's to me, my sense of you previous to like Thirsty, <laughs> the Eastside Brewery books. And so like, okay, for me, it's a departure. Like you can do your own life. But for me, I was like, okay, well, these are two different things. Very different. <laughs> They're very different. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, gosh, it was so, you know, I was teaching at the time when I started writing romance and like erotic romance and I was teaching at a Catholic school. So I was really doing this on the down low. <laughs> uh, the... The cowboy books, I th- oh man, I can't even remember. I think there was a writing contest, like a Valentine's Day writing contest on one of the websites that I used to read. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, let me see if I can enter something. I need a theme. I need some kind of hooky thing. And I was right. like, cowboys. I like cowboys. Like, I... <laughs> I was a new. I didn't read a lot of romance growing up, and so I started maybe about 10, 12, 13 years ago when <sighs> Kindle started to become more popular. Oh, and I was reading. Um, let's see, Lorelai James is one mm-hmm. of my favorites. She has such a great series called The Blacktop Cowboys. Mm-hmm. And anybody who's a fan of the series is like Blacktop Cowboys. Like we love it. Okay. <laughs> like there's no way to not be a Blacktop Cowboys fan if you like fall into the books, and that's it. Um, But they were so sexy and they were so like, I don't know, they were delicious and they were different from anything I had read before because I was reading more traditional, like less, less spicy books. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, maybe I can write a cowboy romance, like a short story and see how that goes. And so I I tried it and I'm like, well, this is fun. (laughs) (laughs) And like, I'm not like I grew up in the middle of the city, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not rural in any way, but. (laughs) I remember, like, I'm Filipino, Mm -hmm. and I remember growing up and going to visit family friends in the Central Valley. Okay. And they they owned grape farms and almond orchards, and it was a very different life from what I lived in L.A. We would go for weekends and be there for the harvest and, like, just go – running by the creek and riding our bicycles and my parents were very overprotective of my sister and me um when we were in the city but when Mm -hmm. they were out there in the country they were like just go (laughs) (laughs) like we'll see you later when you're hungry just come in right Right. and it was so different for me and my sister to be treated that way Mm -hmm. to be given that much like freedom and leeway that it became this like like a playground for me like it was so much fun to be out on a farm right and I have very warm memories of that and like when I was in college and taking Asian American studies classes I learned about 
all the different ethnic groups that settled the Central Valley and like established the agricultural industry there yeah. before like large corporations took it over. Mm-hmm. And like our family friends were one of those families. They were in Delano in early March. Okay. And so I remember all of these things, like they were kind of formative, even though I didn't think about them a lot. And as I was writing these cowboy stories, I'm like, oh, it's got to be set in Central Valley. Uh, um, okay. It has to be like it. The environment, I remember, like we drive through sometimes. We have, you know, friends who live in Bakersfield. Like these are, it's California history that is a part of me, I mm-hmm. feel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if, the thing that I saw about cowboy romance at the time um, was that it was very white. And Mm -hmm. so the Central Valley seemed like the perfect place to set a diverse series of cowboy books. Okay. And eventually the series became five books. And, but I haven't talked about how they became books today. Oh man, (laughs) I get carried away. (laughs) Um, It was a, I had written a few short stories, kind of like sketches and I queried Jennifer Haymore mm-hmm. at Sam Hain, and she contacted me back. She's all like, I like your writing, but we don't really publish collections of short stories. Can you take one of these and turn it into a novella? And I did, and that was Cowboy Valentine. And wow. That was 2015. Yeah, okay. that was my first published uh, book. Wow, okay. Yeah, that was it. It's kind of a complicated story, but yes. No, but it's interesting because that's, that's wow. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know that. So I'm like, okay. Um, because it's so, part of me feels like, part of me feels like everything that I've not gone through, whatever, you know, the life I've lived, like influences my books. And then sometimes it just feels like a complete, you know, frolic and detour, a complete departure. Mm-hmm. But um, when I look back, as I get older, I realize the influence that certain things have had on me. And it was, I don't know if the influence was outsized or, it just came, it just, it's just in a book. It's, you know, it's hard to say, but it's pretty what interesting. What has been the, for you though, what have been like the biggest influences on your work? Like what nudged your work into what it is today? Oh my god! Because for me, it's a sense of place. Like you can see that I grew up in the city when you read East Side Brewery. You can see that I spent time like in the Central Valley right. in my cowboy books. Like for me, it's place, 100%. Oh. No, for um, me, it's people. So um, I write, and I only know this because somebody asked me this recently, um, but I like to write like about complicated heroines. Um, mm-hmm. And so I, it's just, it, it's character. Um, and it's that, that's actually how I write. So in my head, there are people talking. I'm not going to get into it. There are people talking all the time. And, you know, it is what it is. And there are people talking. So to me, it's like about writing down their stories. Um, and then to be are honest, they, are they based on people that you meet or just no. people that come yes to you? and no? So, so I write two genres. So in the crime genre, yes. So for a short period of time, after I left the East coast, I'm from New York city. Um, I lived in Ohio. Um, this is like an early marriage job, temporary job situation. And mm-hmm. so I lived in Cleveland and I practiced law there for five years. And so for the crime, my crime books, I lived in Cleveland for five years. The books are like, you know, I'm like 11 books in. You know? So the books exceed any time I live there. But it was such a character rich place. It was sort of like Cleveland was like a mini Chicago basic or Boston or any of those kinds of cities that have like a lot of low level corruption. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I don't even know what to say, like low level corruption. A friend and I were just talking about this recently. And um I like New York city was like big corruption and I was never, I had not been exposed to small corruption. And so it was a lot about vindication. Like there was a lot of vindication because when I was there, I didn't, I don't know, maybe I had never been exposed. I mean, I was a child. So what did I know? You know, you read the paper and then you move on. But um, as an Mm -hmm. adult, I hadn't been exposed to that. And so when I moved to Los Angeles, like I would read newspaper articles still about Cleveland. And I was like, oh, well, that guy went to jail and that guy went to jail and that guy went to jail. And I felt sort of justified, you know, and (laughs) I was like, oh, okay. It wasn't just me. You know what I mean? Like, you're like walking around. You're like, you know, these people are doing illegal things, right? And everybody's like, hey, this is how it's done. And I was like, okay, I'm not involved in that, but okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, So there was a lot of that. And also I got, um, there was uh, a newspaper reporter from the Plain Dealer who called to interview me about some of these same issues. 
and she wrote an article about like this low level corruption. I was like, I felt so vindicated, but I wanted to write a character. So I have one character, Casey Court, who, you know, is going through this. And I wanted to write a character who is trying to like eke out a living um, despite all these things going on around her that are fundamentally unfair. Um, Mm. But there's something about, and this is something I actually I love to read about. There's something about people overcoming unfairness, um, like systemic unfairness that I find fascinating. And satisfying. Uh, it's satisfying. Oh that's gosh. the thing. So I, I just wanted to, that's the, th- I find it really satisfying. I don't know what it is about mm-hmm. that. Although, you know, it's a popular TV topic. I mean, it's not unknown, but it's something very satisfying about people being able to operate in a little fair space and bring justice when there's this overall sort of like miasma of either corruption or whatever it is, you know, and I really and, enjoy that. <laughs> and I feel like place would be an important factor in that because when you think about large cities like LA and New York like corruption is just so it's too big to handle like my brain can't wrap around it but if you have like a smaller city like Cleveland like you would know all the players you would know all the people who are involved all the pieces on the board yeah so you're right there is a sense interesting it is a sense of place so when I lived there I think between the time I lived there the population dropped from like half million to like I want to say now it's like 350 and maybe bigger. But I mean, oh, yeah. so there was this huge, so the number of, you know, people can have an outsized influence, the players. Um, and so that to me is fascinating. And actually, I still look up people from time to time. And there's this one attorney that drove me crazy. And I just looked her up and she just got disbarred. And I was Ooh. like, I know. <laughs> I <was> like, <laughs> <laughs> and so I have a post it. I have a board where I work on the book I'm working on, and I have a post it. And I don't think I can address her in this book because I'm dealing with other issues in this book. And I'm like, but I have a post it because I was like, well, now we can like maybe deal with this part of it. We have this magical post it. Who knows where it will lead? Exactly. But I do spend a lot of time thinking about justice in terms of romance. I don't know. Um, I read romance. I started reading romance when I was really young. So, and it was not my primary because I've always read everything that came in the house because I don't have a good filter about reading, but it was probably 50% of what I read um, Mm -hmm. until I was in my mid twenties, maybe mid thirties. Now it's maybe like 20%, um, but I also have less time because of child, but it always has had an outsized influence um, because it, it, there was something about it, something about the idea of, I don't know, people finding each other. I don't know. I still find it quite compelling. (laughs) I still find it quite compelling. Um, But you said you didn't read, you haven't read romance. So you're not, you're not one of the people like us who read romance, started reading romance before you were 10. (laughs) No, but you know, I did read a lot of different things. And I remember always latching onto the romance subplots, you Mm -hmm. know, like I remember, I think when the first sexy book I remember reading (laughs) was like, I was in grade school, like much younger than I needed to be reading these books. Right. But it was uh, Anne McCaffrey. It was probably one of the, like the dragon singer, dragon drums books. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's been a long time. But the idea is that they live on this planet where like deadly things fall from the sky, uh, threads that can kill and burn you. Mm -hmm. But they figured out a way to, to, to battle them because there are dragons that live on the planet <laughs> and people ride on the dragons, but you have to like mind meld with them magically. Mm-hmm. But, oh man, I can't believe I'm talking about this. I loved it so much as a child. <laughs> <laughs> but like if your dragons like fall in love and want to mate, like you have to mate with the person who's mind melded with them. <laughs> And I remember thinking like, oh, my God, that's amazing. (laughs) (laughs) And so I always like latched on to these like romance plots and these like erotic plots. And it was just like this like gem that you would find in different kinds of books. But I never actually read like straight up romance. I didn't have access to the books. There weren't any in my library that I knew about. Um, oh, wait, so you didn't have the yeah. spinning carousel? So, I mean, when I was a kid, there was mm-hmm. always like, um, and okay, so I lived in Brooklyn, and then I lived in Connecticut, but um, mm-hmm. every library I can think, I mean, I have very vivid memories of them. That's not a problem with memories, but they would always have a carousel. They still have those carousels, actually, um, mm-hmm. sometimes off to the side, sometimes in a corner, sometimes in an area we had to turn the light on. I remember that library. <laughs> <laughs> like why is it dark back here (laughs) we don't talk about that room exactly 
it was the weirdest thing. I was like, it's dark back here in the corner. I turned on the light. I was like, oh, ho, ho, here we go. I, I took all those out that day. But um, but I remember always having a carousel. And maybe it was the covers because, it was you know, it's a clench cover. And they were painted back then because I'm old. Right. And there's some, They're I was like, beautiful. I know you're like, what's this? Like, mm-hmm, what's this? Mm-hmm. Because the kind of, my mother read English novels, which had not uninteresting covers and most of the dust jackets had gone. Um, my grandmother read like pulp fiction, but she read a lot of like popular books, like, I don't know, like Ira Levin or just who, whoever was pro- Godfather, like all oh, those kinds of things. You know, those covers, like, it's like, here's a yeah, puppet yeah. master. I mean, they're kind of bland. And so like Mario Puzo. Yeah. And so those covers I would never found compelling. I would open the book and then I would read them, but there was nothing about the covers that said, Oh, come read me. Um, but the romance covers, they were like, read me. I was like, yes. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, Pick okay. me up now and oh. read me. Like, stop what you're doing. <laughs> exactly. And I'm like, is she on a boat? Why is she on a boat? Is she wearing a dress? That dress is coming off. What is going on? Like it was always like so much of that. So I found them really compelling in that way. And I'm sure that that's how I got in. And then you would start the book and, this is like the 80s. So there was always some like rapey craziness going on. And you're like, what mm-hmm. is going? What? Why are they taking her on a ship? What? You know, just so yeah. much like, what? And then- Why and then, don't they get off the horse first? And exactly. <laughs> so many. <laughs> like Julie Garwood back in the day. I can think mm-hmm. of all of those. And so I I found them so compelling. But I will be honest, like now as an adult, I realized that my I'm better at writing crime fiction than I am at romance. And that's been a hard pill to swallow. I think my romance is a little out there. I was always this in my head. I was like, well, I'm going to write a romance, but it's going to be different. And that was not necessarily like a winning marketing strategy. I'll say that. Hmm. Hmm. Well, no. It li- I always felt like kind of an imposter in romance. I still do because I didn't grow up with it and I don't have... I think part of the reason I didn't have access to the books is I went to Catholic schools and they weren't in our libraries at the school. Mm -hmm. Um, And then like at my library where I grew up, it was two stories. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) All of that stuff was upstairs and all of my stuff was downstairs, like the YA and the, Mm -hmm. at the time it wasn't called YA, but like kids for, you know, books for kids and teenagers were all downstairs. So I never like I didn't go upstairs and then by the time I would have wanted to go upstairs I went to my school libraries and the nuns would not have allowed these books so they weren't there That's yeah so interesting because I yeah. yeah no because I did go to Catholic school before I mean I, before I switched and you're right that would not have been but I was um my mother um this may not be the best parenting would drop me off at the public library like it's hard to explain in New York it's a big the Brooklyn Public Library and she would drop mm-hmm. me off and then, you know, go find parking or whatever, <laughs> like whatever. And then, <laughs> you know, because it's 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 in the middle of like a plaza. So it's kind of hard to try. It's like a huge plaza with pretty buildings, but no parking. So she would drop me off, go find parking and then look for her own books and then like come back later. So mm-hmm. I had a lot of time to wander all the nooks and crannies of the library. And it was just like, look at that. Look at this. Look at that. Because when I was little, so my mother read a lot and she really wanted me to read, I think mainly so she could read. You know what I mean? So I was oh, everyone be quiet so I can, read. can yeah. read. And so when I started <laughs> reading books, it was just like, I would read these books and I was like, these aren't really good. I don't understand why you and my grandmothers are like sitting around reading because I don't see the benefit of this. Can I watch some TV? You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to. These aren't good. <laughs> I know. I, I want to watch Eight is Enough. And I remember once she dropped me off and she said, you need to look everywhere. She's like, you need to figure out what kind of book is going to work for you because not every book works for every person. And I never, well, until she said that, I never thought about it. I don't know. It was like seven or eight. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. And then I, that's when I started exploring like a larger area of the library separate from the kids section. Um, fantastic. And so it was that is fantastic because I was like, I don't know. I read like Johnny Tremaine or there's some of these books I read and I was like, mm-hmm. I don't know if I'm interested in a boy's experience in the Revolutionary War. <laughs> Imagine that. Um, or even <laughs> although, although I used to do this thing in my elementary school where it was like a little room with like dusty books and like some like R.L. Stein that kids took out again and again and again. Mm-hmm. And I felt bad for the books that were dusty because mm-hmm. nobody wanted to read them. And so I read a bunch of like old, like falling apart 1950s, like Western biographies for boys. Right. Like- <laughs> nine-year-old being like have you heard about Will Bill Hickok and like maybe that's where all my cowboy stuff came from I felt bad for the books that nobody took out 
That's so funny. So, I mean, but a lot of those, like, they just, like, um, I think my grandmother may have had a Hardy Boys selection. I don't know for who. Oh, fine. <laughs> and I, I, I read those, and I was like, well, like, five of these in, I don't see why I'd read the rest. You know what I mean? Like, I kind of get what's going to happen. Nothing. You were, like, the counterpoint to my husband who read, because they only had Nancy Drew. <laughs> <laughs> and they only, and they had a lot of babysitters club. He's all like, "Oh yeah, those were great." <laughs> <laughs> no, I remember those. Oh my god, the yellow and blue hardback. I can see them because they were at the you house. Can see it, right? I can see yeah. it. Yeah. And the paintings on the covers. Are absolutely, so great. absolutely. <laughs> There's so much of that. But I just so I read it. So it just took a long time to narrow it down. I'm gonna be honest, my reading still is not that narrow. So I read a lot of nonfiction all the time because I'm always like, I'm gonna learn some magic that's gonna solve all my life problems. So I read a lot of nonfiction and then I read widely across fiction because I'm not always looking for the same thing. I'm always fascinated if you go to romance events with these readers who read like 10 romances in a row and I'll, and I'll read two and I'll be like, okay, you know what? I'm going to take a break and now I'm going to go read this crime story. I'm going to read this women's fiction or I'm going to read this memoir or something else. And then I'll come back to it. I've never been able to read any author, or any genre, one back to back to back to back. I don't have the bandwidth for it. I don't know why, but I don't. Um, it's a contrast. I need a different a different world, a different voice in between. I do. Personally. It, it, it's just funny because as we authors, we're trying to sell people back to back to back to back experiences. <laughs> we were just I was just on a Zoom call talking about marketing with authors. And this is what we're talking about. We're like, how do you get them to jump to the next one or buy the fourth one or whatever? We're just having that conversation. And it's mm. funny because I'm marketing to people who read a completely different way than I do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think about that a lot too. Um, it's just it's just different. I mean, I'm a different reader than most of my readers, and that's it's its own thing because I read like I'll read some authors, I love them, but I only want to read two of their books a year. Like I don't want to read ten of them, and it's nothing about them. It's just like I need something different. Um, but then I'm also trying to sell people like read all ten of these this year. <laughs> well, then you're you're marketing to the people who do that kind of thing. Yes, who are like yes, give me more. The binge know? readers, which is some of the binge buyers, like you want to market to those people who are like I gotta have them all, and I you see them like I just had a a marketing promo, and it's like, did you just buy all ten? Why did you buy all ten? Like, are you gonna read them all now? Like, that's a lot. <laughs> Well, I think it's so fun when you come out with a book and people like, you're like, oh my God, this took me six months to write. This right. took me this long to write. I like, it was a slog. And then they read it like overnight and you're like, Jesus. I know exactly. And they email you that like this happened. They email you and they're like, okay, I finished that. And I was like, well, I started that in September. So it's going to be a minute before you get the next one. <laughs> oh my gosh, my poor readers. I have been leaving them hanging for book three in this series for so long. How, so how is writing going? So I've been to your house, I will say this, um, in, while you were writing, and my son and I, or me, myself, was entertaining your child. Thank uh, you so much for that. Also, and you took her for a walk, and she still, when she sees dandelions, she remembers you guys. Uh, and my son did that on purpose, and I told you, I apologize in advance, because now your neighborhood is going to be filled with like blowing dandelions. But I think um, somebody must have done that for him <laughs> as a kid, and he just felt, he was like, oh, I got to teach her this. And and I was like, honey, yes. honey, I don't know if that's the thing I'm a teacher. <laughs> and he was like, no, no, no. This is like the thing she needs to know. <laughs> well, he taught her well because we go to the park and she's like, dandelions. <laughs> and is so happy to see them. And so he taught her some in like short amount of time that you guys were together. She learned something at a very important life skill. <laughs> no, and he actually enjoyed reading to her too. So one of the things I love about your house is that you have like an active rotation of books for your daughter. And um, so I grew up that way, like with like, we go to the library and then we'd have like these books would come in and come out, you know, in addition to the ones that were just in the house. Mm -hmm. And I, I sort of love that because I do the same thing for my son. And it, to me, it's just so important to expose him to all the things I can, and then he can do what he wants later. <laughs> right. And he can decide. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right now he's reading, I don't know, something called City Spies or something. I can't quite figure it out. Some series. But um, what is... I have, okay, I have like a thousand questions for you, but okay, I'm going to switch, because I have like, there's so many things I want to know, but I'm going to switch topics and I'm going to ask you about, so did you, have you been able to write during the last year? And I know that, like, so you have a very young child and, you know, there hasn't even been any like school, like all the activities that you do, like whatever the music classes, you know, the stuff, the stuff. Right, all the been, stuff. The stu all the stuff, because I did it too in LA, um, is, is not been going on. And I don't know what it would have been like to have a child 
his age without the stuff because that's what I did we would go to the zoo on Monday and we'd go to like look at the horses on Tuesday I mean I had a whole routine like it was like Griffith Park and then we would go to the zoo and then we'd go to which all kind of in the same place but we'd then we'd go to like La Brea Tar Pits on Wednesday and you know we'd make it to the you know Museum of Natural History like it was such a strict two-week rotation of all of those activities so we could be out of the house and keep him busy when he was like two and three so Mm -hmm. what if so i has it well I guess it's impacted your writing obviously well yeah I mean (laughs) I'm in you know I'm in a lot of people are in this situation but it she's about to turn three in in a couple months and I've been home and so you know around the time that the pandemic started and lockdown started here in LA was when I was starting to look for preschool programs for her. I was really excited about her being able to like have a little bit of daycare and more socialization. Mm -hmm. We were doing like a couple of in-person classes, a music class, all all the things that you mentioned. (laughs) And then it all just went womp, like it all just shut down and they shut down the playgrounds and they shut down the libraries. That's true. The playgrounds are hard. Yeah. Playgrounds were the hardest for me, I think, um, because we used to go one every day, maybe two. Mm -hmm. And so it became this like, all right, well, now I have to be the source of like all of your like recreation (laughs) and (laughs) development, like for as long as this thing goes. And, you know, the city was in turmoil Mm -hmm. so much last year. Mm -hmm. And it was I felt like I was, oh man, like a shock absorber for my child, Mm -hmm. just like. Like, you know, when you have those, like, sci-fi stories where there's a dome over the city and it's just getting cracked. Yeah. (laughs) And you're like, I can hold it. It's okay. It's fine. Just keep living your lives, right? And so (laughs) I felt like this glass dome over my child. But um, we, you know, like, we figured out that she likes to bake. She likes to cook. She likes – we have a little, like, container garden that we take care of every day. I bought a sand table. I fill buckets with water. <laughs> she like plays with her. I was like, we walk around the neighborhood 5,000 times. We have a little free library. We go look at the other little free yeah. libraries. And like, what else are you going to do? Like, I can't really complain because we're safe. We're healthy. We have resources. But like, we can't rely on the things that I would have relied on right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like trying to solve that problem has taken a lot of the mental energy, I feel, that would have gone into writing books. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And so I and I and I admire the people who are able to produce so much during this period. I do too. You know? I was not that oh person. Oh my god. <laughs> while, you know, like while parenting, while having a full-time job, you know, they're releasing books, like they're on top of everything and it looks so great from the outside. Like I I don't know what's going on on the inside. Right. But for me, it was almost like, well, let's just do this. Let's I'm going to it was a, you know, like backstory. It was a long haul to like be able to have a child. Mm -hmm. And so like now I feel like this is an opportunity for me not to miss anything. And so, um, you know, I kind of just dove into that. Um, And the writing has taken a backseat to that for sure. And how was it? So I'm going to be honest, like I don't, oh, so I had a similar thing. Obviously my child is older and there was Zoom school, uh, in the beginning, but then there was the summer and the summer we usually travel and he's always been enrolled in camp or travel and not having those two things. And I actually used to have a huge productivity spurt during the summer because he would go to camp in Europe and it's nine to five or eight to five because they, they're considerate of parents working. So they're all about feeding your kid four meals a day. And, um, I know, I know they cook and you bring nothing. I just, Oh, I can't tell you how much I love it. I drop them off. (laughs) I drop him off. He's so excited because I feed him at home and he would get there and he would lie and say he'd eat breakfast so he could just have what they had. And I was like, you don't have to lie. Just eat the food. You know, because they'd be like, did you eat? And he'd be like, no. no. And I'd be like, I just fed you eggs. Like what? And he's like, but they have, it's hard to explain because it's not in English, but they have like um chocolate rolls or whatever, or they have cereal, mm-hmm. which I would never feed him, or they have all these things. And so, and he'd come home and he's like, like and then, treats, yeah. and he's like, we had chicken for lunch and it was really good, or their mashed potatoes were really good or whatever he would say. <laughs> and I was like, fine, you know, whatever. But I did have this huge productivity spirit because I could go shopping mm-hmm. and then maybe see some friends and then also have the hours of writing and not have to stop at 2 PM. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So that I missed a lot, but I, <sighs> I want to say, no, it's actually true. I'm quite grateful. So when I got over the resentment of not having that time, 
and not being mm-hmm. able to travel. We did do the thing. Mm-hmm. So I have walked this neighborhood about a thousand times. I'm over it. Um, mm-hmm. But we did. We like, walked. It's nice. I'm and done. I'm like, look, every single day. Look, they're eating bacon again. Look, that dog is still cute in the window. But we still, you know, but we do it every day. And he's so acclimated mm-hmm. to it. Like as soon as one of his classes ends, he puts on his shoes at 10, 15. He's like, he's ready for the walk. And I'm like, even I'm not, I'm over it. But yes, let's go. So we walked mm-hmm. every day. And I actually talked to him so much more than I, I mean, I, he talks a lot. I mean, you've met him. He talks a lot. <laughs> but I was able to talk to him all day and have like, hear his thoughts. And it's a time that I would not get back because he's, you know, he's going to be like 13 in a minute and not the least bit interested in me. And that's fine. But it was interesting mm-hmm. to have this like later childhood time to spend a lot of mm-hmm. time with him. So I have no regrets about that. And you're right. I have resources. I have a roof over my head. The food's getting, you know, there's money for food. Like it's life is okay, except for, you know, wearing a mask and not being able to talk to any, see anybody. I and, see anybody go, go anywhere. <laughs> go anywhere. So it's just, it's been the two of us and I'm sure he's done looking at me. But like, so that I do appreciate, but the writing really did suffer and I couldn't, it was hard having him zoom because he wanted to do zoom in the dining room, not his room. Cause he doesn't, he's an extrovert and he doesn't like to be alone, which is mm-hmm. fine. I'm an introvert. So it's, you know, it is what it is. But so he's in the dining room and he's like, did you hear what she said on zoom? And like every five minutes he'd come in and be like, you know, the teacher said this or they said that. Cause he's so used to having that interaction at school that mm-hmm. the writing really took a back seat. And so for the first time I didn't finish a book, I don't know, in 2020. And I start, I kept starting new books and I'm not that person. I like to start a book and finish it and then go on to the next one. And so mm-hmm. I came into 2021 with three half written books yeah. <laughs> and we just, you know, you can't publish half a book. And that was the, I want to say that was the sort of hardest part. So I just finished one, um, like Ooh, last month congratulations! I and I'm now working on like finishing two and hopefully I'll finish three and then I'll feel more accomplished. It won't feel like I just threw some words together in 2020 and hope for the best. But it, mm-hmm. but it did slow down the writing because I wasn't able to even have, like I arranged my writing in Los Angeles around school. So, you know, I drop them off at 8.30 or whatever it is, I don't know, and come back and then I would write until 2, 2.30, mm-hmm. whatever. I have to drive. He's in Hollywood, so it's you know kind of a hassle. So, you know, I had to drive and get him. But it was that four or five hours. It wasn't perfect. It wasn't great, but I'd managed it. Mm-hmm. And then that was gone. <laughs> And I was like, yeah. people are like, yeah. they're like, but you've always been home. I was like, I was home alone. Alone. <laughs> <laughs> can, we, can, we, can we emphasize the alone part? Because the bouncing person, he has a ball because he, he doesn't sit still either. So he's like bouncing around and he's like chatting. And he wants, can I have, can you cut the banana into coins? Can you cut the apple into both? <laughs> can I have some water, mommy? Can I have some berries, mommy? I can't peel this tangerine, mommy. <laughs> like, <it's> just, <laughs> um, so... Can I have some crackers? I can't reach the crackers in the cabinet. And I felt like it was every 10 minutes. Maybe it wasn't that often. But it, so that is not a, a, a formula for concentrated writing and output at all whatsoever. So I can yeah. only imagine since your daughter can't, you know, can't get her own banana. Like he could get his own darn banana. But, you know, he he likes, you know, mommy getting his banana for whatever reason that is. Um, so I can't imagine like how it would stop. Do you know, like going forward, do you think you'll be able to enroll her in the fall? So his school has gone back. You got to love this two days a week, four hours a day. This is not like perfect by any means. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, our eight hours. So now I have to like drop him off at eight and pick him up at noon. <laughs> I was like, well, and you have a drive. Yes. And I was like, okay, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what can I do? I can come home, I come home. Shower, and then go out and get you. <laughs> exactly. That's kind of how it is to be honest. <laughs> Um, but I, he loves it. Like he came home two weeks ago when they first did the one day, they did one day first mm-hmm. week and he came home and I was like, Oh, I missed you. Cause I had, I hadn't realized like I'd gotten used to him being here. And mm-hmm. I was like, Oh, I missed you. And he goes, Oh, I didn't think about you for the moment you dropped me off until it was time. Oh, for gosh. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, that's fine. Like it's, a, it's, it really is fine. And then I looked Call at your own tangerine kid. Exactly. <laughs> get your own cuties. And so then I was like, how was it? And he looked at me, he got in the back of the car because they have, we used to have a different way of dropping off. And he got in the back of the car and he looks at me and goes, this is the best day I've had in the last 365. Oh, that's and, wonderful. And I was like, oh, you really, because he is an extra and he loves talking to people. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, I'm really happy for you that this may go back in some form because this is what you love. You love talking to people, running around all day, like gabbing with your Mm -hmm. friends and all of that. And I appreciate that, that you love that. But do you think you'll be able to enroll her in the fall or I don't even know? I don't know. You know, like I'm really nervous about the vaccines Mm -hmm. and being able to have 
uh, a vaccine for her will give me all the peace of mind. Um, but I, you know, we, we've talked about it and if there's a program that looks like it would fit with <laughs> what <laughs> we're, our anxieties, right. then, yeah, we will. Um, I really don't know. I really don't know. No, I don't know about that age because – so at his school, it's K through 6. They did okay. the younger kids first, and I don't know what that is because I only have one. So there are other families, obviously, that have more than one kid. Um, but mm-hmm. in his case, they just have a big classroom. Well, the classrooms were big to begin with, but they – there's only 20 kids in the class or 22 now or whatever there is. And so they separated the desks and put little – I don't know, uh, plexiglass around it. And there's like a little slot in there. He says it's like a mail slot, which he loves because that's how the hand papers through. He thinks it's the cutest. <laughs> he thinks it's delightful. I'm like, you find this delightful? He was like, absolutely. I was like, okay, whatever. <laughs> um, so they've done it that way, but then they still can only have contact with two teachers in a day. And they used to have contact with four or five. You know, there'd be mm-hmm. like art and gym and the library. And then like the person who taught math and the person who taught English or whatever, they rotated that way. And they have eliminated a lot of that with the rules of contact. So, but I feel a little, the teachers have all been vaccinated as of March. Um, so there's a comfort there. And well, I don't know. It's, it's more for him than it is for me. Like I mm-hmm. had to overcome some of my discomfort because he's such an extrovert. and It was so important to him to have that socialization. Yeah, for sure. Uh, oh, I'm so happy for him. Uh, That's wonderful. So it's great. Okay. But see, I've gotten sidetracked. Okay. I have to ask you about baking. Okay. So I, <laughs> no, so I bake, I, okay. I don't enjoy, ba- I don't dislike baking. I just don't do it. Like I, we, when we watch when the British baking show thing was really popular, like, um, so my son and I, he watches like an hour of TV a night, actually, well, during the pandemic, it's more than an hour. I'm going to just be honest, but like previously we'd watch an hour a night and like, we just go through different shows and for whatever number of months that would have lasted, it was the British baking show and we're watching it. And he was like, how do you know about all this baking stuff? And I was like, I can bake. I just don't bake. I mean, you know, I have a mixer and I have pans. I just, it's not something, I don't even know. I mean, I grew up, my grandparents baked and my mother baked. This is not something I did. Like they baked every Sunday and it was like, you know, Sunday was like, they bake a cake and one of my grandmothers always made fruit pies, you know, or or like peach cobblers, cobblers, pies, those kinds of things. And I don't really, I actually, I don't like desserts. So that's probably part of the reason I don't bake. Um, Mm, That's a good reason. (laughs) I don't mind them. It's just not, would not be my preference. I like salty. I'm a salty food person, salty, mm-hmm. savory. So I don't bake that often. And he was like, well, how do you know about yeast? Or how do you know about rising? Or how do you know about like, you know, double acting? And I was like, I can bake. <laughs> I just don't. So after the British baking show came on, I did bake more because he was interested in that. So like we made Madeleines, like with his, some, well, this is right, right before the pandemic, like a friend came over and we all made Madeleines or we made cookies and then we would make some, some cake where there's no leavening other than eggs um, in a bun pan. And he really liked that. And now he's into making like banana bread and things like that. So, you know, I will bake with him and I usually bake once a week because I used to bake muffins for school so he could take them mm-hmm. for snack time. Um, so my baking is quite utilitarian. Like you need banana chocolate chip muffins. Okay. Let me make the banana chocolate chip muffins. And now we're done. I'm going to put everything away and we're moving on. <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. But you seem to enjoy baking um, and clearly like you have mastered procrastinating baking for years it's clearly a creative it's a creative outlet because i look at your like instagram and i'm like damn i was like wow what did i do today well i don't know like i, I peeled an avocado <laughs> i don't know like i mean i cook every day but it's not the same because baking is a little more precise than cooking maybe but wh- how have you always baked no, I am not always baked, and I didn't grow up with it at all. I think we had one bag of sugar my entire childhood, <laughs> <laughs> which is a good thing. I think. Yes. But yeah, she ne- my mom never baked, and um, maybe there was like one Duncan Hines cake in my past, like during birthdays, maybe, but like, no, there was okay, no baking. I'm going to pause you. So in my head, you're this romance writing baker, but clearly you're that's not how you grew up, because I feel no. like- <laughs> Listen, I carved myself out of stone. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, no, they weren't. <laughs> I'm a weirdo in my family for sure. Like my dad was an engineer. My mom was a nurse. My sister went to, she was an electrical engineer for a while. Like they're all very left brain people. Mm-hmm. And like, um, I was just very different, like just a weirdo. And so 
um, the baking thing, when my sister moved, she's much older than me, when she moved out of the house, I would go and visit her for, for the holidays. And one of the things that I remember doing with her was we made a gingerbread house. And it was the first time that I remember baking as a project and like, we're going to do this. We're going to get candy. We're going to get the mixer out. And it's such a warm memory for me that like when I became an adult, Mm -hmm. whenever I had a chance to like try a new recipe that looked interesting, I would do it. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't, I wasn't like afraid to try anything. And it became like quiet, non- verbal time for me mm-hmm. yeah I know <laughs> which is so important to find like your flow state when that has nothing to do with words when you're a writer mm-hmm. I know and during pandemic it's been a great um like outlet for me and for my daughter mm-hmm. um even though she's little she there's a lot of like tactical learning and measuring in baking that has been helpful for for us when we pass the time together at home mm-hmm. And then we get to eat something at the end. That's true. Okay. <laughs> That's true. It doesn't come to the product. That is so true. <laughs> it's learning that comes to the product instead of just like, oh, let's make some oobleck and then you got to throw it away. Right. <laughs> like, this is a lot more fun. Like bread tomorrow will be great, yeah. you know? Oh. So, yeah, that's part of it. Getting our hands in, you know, different materials, the smells, the tastes and like safety around the oven, like little things yeah. has, has been fun to teach her and like our our kitchen has become our workshop for her art projects, for our baking projects, our cooking projects. When we go out into the garden, we come back in, wash, you know, wash our vegetables. And like, it makes me feel a little bit like I can give her the experience of a preschool Mm -hmm. at home a little bit. Um, And baking is one of those aspects that's helped me to do that. Um, and, And I also have friends who bake. And so it became an outlet for us to like, bond and so I started the Baker's Notebook podcast with my friend Mm -hmm. and since we were both baking a lot more I think also our anxiety (laughs) I'm just gonna make a big loaf of bread and just like knead it until I don't feel so bad anymore and so it's it's been a nice outlet in that way too okay but I feel like you're downplaying it so in addition to the podcast which I was listening to well while driving because that's what I do and biking because that's what I'm doing now for the flow no word state like I'm like if I just bike really fast and I can like think um you have I mean you have like you know you keep yeast in your freezer so it's like slightly more (laughs) than um the average baker but what is there like a Okay, so let me say this. So I had one grandmother who baked only cakes. Like, she was really good at it. I mean, like, they're really good. But she only baked cakes. And my other grandmother was, like, into fruit desserts or something. And my mother mainly baked – she baked cookies and then things for her office. Like, whenever they needed an office thing, she would bake that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I never asked her why. It was something we did as a kid. She would be like, oh, they need a pound cake or whatever they needed for this Mm -hmm. thing. Let's do it. And, that you know, I would just do it because, you know, as a kid, I didn't ask that many questions now that I think about it. (laughs) Um, and then she would bring me home a slice because obviously you can't slice it before you do, before you take it anywhere. Um, so that's kind of. Although I have a tip: if you ever make brownies, you can just cut off the edges and eat them, and then cut the brownies, and they look even more perfect. Oh, and I... no one will know that you had like <laughs> the equivalent of six brownies at home around the edge. <laughs> that's hilarious. So I so there was it was it was everybody did it. But it was pretty like narrow a field and it was only when I was older, like as a young adult, I did bake bread and and I did expand a lot of the things I was baking because there's a lot of things I'd wanted to try as a kid that I just never done. Um, Mm -hmm. And then then that, I'm going to be honest, then the phase passed. So it was sort of like, well, now that I've mastered this kind of chocolate chip cookie or my favorite, like I have a favorite French chocolate brownie recipe that was in the New York Times. And I was like, okay, well, this is the, I've tasted all the brownies. I don't really like them. This one I like. So now I have this one. Or I've tried like 50,000 chocolate chip cookie recipes. I like the sour cream chocolate chip cookies. This is the one I like, and this is the one I do. So it was, I was more looking for finding the thing that I wanted, perfecting the mm-hmm. way I wanted to have it. And once I have that, I file the recipe away. I'm going to be quite honest. And then I move on to the next thing. I never had an interest in it generally. I was more like, what is the thing I like that I can make taste the way I want? And then let me move on mm-hmm. to the next thing. So when people ask me, can you bring brownies or something? I'm like, well, I have this one recipe. It actually happened in February, right before the pandemic. Somebody had a mm-hmm. birthday or something. I don't know. And they said, oh, can you make brownies? And I thought, oh, I'll make it my way. I didn't say this out loud. And I brought them that. 
um, or when my child asked for chocolate chip cookies recently, um, I was like, oh, I got this book in graduate school that's called The Perfect Chocolate Chip Cookie. And I like the 33rd recipe in there that's the sour cream chocolate chip cookies. And that's the one I always <laughs> make. It's true. It has a flag, a tape flag in it. You know what I mean? So, or mm-hmm. once I perfected biscuits, like rolled or dropped, mm-hmm. these are the ones I like. And so this is how I make it. Or I make like a French, what is it called? It's hard to, I don't know. I don't know the word in English, but it's a, a certain kind of muffin that's not that sweet. That's basically a butter cinnamon um, nutmeg muffin. And I love nutmeg and baking. So, like, but it's like, mm. this is my muffin. This is my cookie. This is my thing. And I'd never, I don't, I'd never expanded beyond that. I make bread this way. This is my no need, you know, overnight rising bread. And this is my need, you know, I need bread you know, in a couple hours bread. But that's it. Like, so how did you seem to have a way more expansive interest in trying lots of new things? I just always liked I liked cooking shows. I like reading cookbooks. Like, I love the idea of technique. It's just very interesting to me just as a hobby. Mm -hmm. And so um, a few years ago, I started like I didn't come up with this, but somebody started hashtagging procrastinating Mm -hmm. on Instagram. And so I started doing that and it, it, it kind of invited like home bakers to look at my, uh-huh. look at my stuff. And then I started having conversations. And for me, you know, sometimes it's about the product, mm-hmm. but I, I just like the time in the kitchen and I like trying new things and I like seeing if I can do something challenging. Like my co-host on the podcast is like a super accomplished baker and she's a uh, biochemist mm-hmm. like she understands what she's doing whereas it's like I'm just reading a recipe and being like okay what do I do next right. but I never know why right mm-hmm. like put it in a bag and wave it over my head why okay, okay. I'll just do it but I just like I don't know why right <laughs> so I've learned so much from her and it becomes this like a, a challenge mm-hmm. you know like uh, the end product is fine. Like there's only three of us in the house I tend to just give things away or if they're not that good I just toss them mm-hmm. but it's the time in the kitchen, the act, the activity of it, the action, trying new ingredients and like seeing something transform is really satisfying to me. Um, yeah. It's not so much, oh, I, I want to bake all the things, right. <laughs> but like, I want to spend time in the kitchen learning something and, oh, wow. and creating something. It's the action rather than the product. Than the product. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's where it comes from. I'm pretty sure. Okay. I never thought to ask. I know because I look at the, obviously I'm on Instagram and I look at the products and I was like, oh, look, it has chocolate, which I find challenging. Um, actually, I find tempering eggs challenging. It's the one thing that I struggle with, like when making custard or something. Mm-hmm. Oh, I could not. Hollandaise, whatever. Bernays. There's things I it's just. It's a trickle. It's an insane trickle. I if know. you trickle in, the, it's like a slow, like the slowest, most torturous trickle is the only way that I've been able to master it. I do it with a blender, to be honest. Because like if you. Oh, So the blender yeah. creates the heat, enough heat, but not too much heat. And that's how I make those mm-hmm. things now. And custard. I stopped making two years ago because I was just over it. So, <laughs> and my son really likes custard, and I was like, nobody's used those ramekins in a while. We're just not going to talk about it. So, because I just, <laughs> it works eighty percent of the time, but the twenty percent I find so freaking frustrating that I was just mm-hmm. like, I need, and I obviously I don't have the patience to either trickle. And you're right, it is. It's about patience, and that clearly is not my strength. When it, I just want it done. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are so many recipes that are just get it done mm-hmm. that I that I also enjoy. But like I have trouble with flan. Like one of the recipes we're doing for one of our upcoming episodes is um, I don't know. Have you and your son watched Nadia Bakes on Netflix? Yes. OK, so there's the cake that she makes. That's two layers. It's chocolate and um, like custard flan. Mm-hmm. Do you remember this one? Yes. And I'd never made this kind of like magical cake before, <laughs> but it's, it was so cool because, you know, you put it in the pan and there, you know, I can't remember. Is it, it's custard first and then chocolate on top. No, no, it's the other way around. Yeah. Chocolate batter on the bottom and then custard on the top of the pan. You bake it. They switch. You turn it over and there's custard on top. Right. And that is like the most amazing thing I've ever seen. I have a lot of trouble with flans and custards. They come out really bubbly or really grainy. Mm-hmm. But that yeah. one came out great. Yeah. Oh, and you do a water bath always? I'm sorry. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do a little water bath. Yeah. Um, I didn't have a pan that was big enough. I wanted, I need to get a better, like larger oven safe pan for this to work perfectly. Mm-hmm. But the cake was, it was delicious. It was really strange because I'd never made anything that was like a magical layer cake. Mm -hmm. This worked exactly as she said, and it was delicious. 
Wow. Okay. Sorry. It's I just I do yeah. I I just dip in and out of it. It's not it's not a constant and I haven't done that in a while. It's a good thing that it's not a constant. <laughs> I've had a lot of trouble like eating too much during the pandemic oh. and this is one of the reasons why. And so yeah, and and there's only so many people near me who are I can give the food to and they're like, "Please, no more. <laughs> We're done." <laughs> It's delicious, but please stop. Yeah. Trust me, I, I dropped cookies off at a friend's house and I was like, I'm really sorry as I dropped the bag off and run away. <laughs> Must take them. Was, you don't have to eat them. Just take them off my hands. Exactly. Just take them out of my house. I'm like, I know there's only four of you, but here you go. Um, actually, it was Maggie Marr. I'm sure you know her, but I dropped off oh, funny. cookies at her house. Take them, Maggie, please. You know, and I didn't come in that far, but I was like, here, bye. Um, Because I was driving by, (laughs) but it's so true. It's such a problem. All right, I'm okay. I can't tell you how I'm so delighted that you did this um, podcast. I have. Oh, I'm just so delighted. <laughs> I'm so delighted. I love talking to you and and I'm so happy that I was able to like record with you and get my get my family out of the house. <laughs> it's quiet enough for it to happen. Um they always we re- I record the baking podcast on Sundays and they go to the farmers market mm-hmm. and then they go to a playground and it's like daddy daughter day. Mm-hmm. It's really great. And then they come back really tired. So it's like <laughs> Sunday is a wonderfully quiet day for me. It's great. No, that's that's delightful. I um uh, yeah. So <laughs> I have I have quiet Sundays right now too. <laughs> Yay. So everything happens on Sunday. I actually I'm like I did it. <laughs> you just pack it in on Sunday. Like I have the whole day. I got up in bed at everything. like six. I was like, okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to like two stores, like a lot has happened already. Um, oh, awesome. on, on Sunday. But it was so I'm so glad I talked to you because I'm gonna be honest, like the answers you gave is not anything like I thought. I was like, oh, Really? Not. Oh my gosh. No, I guess I didn't know about I knew you volunteered, but I didn't know about Homeboy and I'm gonna rethink think about that because they're very prevalent in LA like you see their t-shirts and they're at a lot of farmers markets selling it seems mm-hmm. to be mostly bread but maybe it's something else now and um so like you know you know they exist like you know they're surround like in LA and you see them and occasionally I drive by some place they have I don't know why I guess I haven't done it in a while and so it's sort of prevalent but I really haven't thought about it and it sounds like a wonderful program that I want to read um read more about and then yeah the founder is um Gregory Boyle mm-hmm. uh, Jesuit priest. He has a book called Tattoos on the Heart, which I really recommend if you're interested um, oh, wow. about the program. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's 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 eye opening. It's a really really amazing program. Yeah, because I'm not from LA. I mean, I've lived here 20 years, but I'm not from here. So, you know, to me, LA came as a package. You know, with all these things that are sort of in the ether, mm-hmm. um, but not, I have not drilled down in every individual thing um, while I've been here. And then also. I'm fascinated by your background in romance because it's just so now I'm going to go look at the cowboy books because now I want to <laughs> read because okay so cowboys generally are not my thing it's not I, but I also don't read like cops I have like a list of people who I'm just like you know not for me mm-hmm. firefighters same, same. And for totally. no good reason or navy seals I'm just like that's a lot of that but um <laughs> Well, you know, I know exactly what you're saying. Like you look at the book and you're like, that's going to be too much. <laughs> I can't do that. I can't do that right now. Um, so, but now, so I've not read them. I mean, I've seen the covers a lot, mainly at these events we've been at together, but now I'm going to go back and that may be how I spend the rest of my Sunday after I do the rest of the stuff. Um, well, they're short. They're novellas. So, you know, I don't want to cut too much into your time. They're short. You're good. But now I want to know more about this sort of like perception of the Central Valley because I've only driven through it maybe twice in my life you know what I mean like Mm -hmm. on my Mm -hmm. way back from San Francisco you know you know flying up and driving down or doing one of those sort of things that we do here like you drive up the one because it's cute but then Mm -hmm. you're ready to go home and then you drive down yeah because it's just so long to drive yeah and then you come back and you're like okay now I gotta do this in four hours so then you're like whizzing through and you don't you know you're like look (laughs) farther look I'm home you know but I don't California is like four states rolled into one it is and I don't think about all of those areas and I don't travel to them to be honest that often and Mm -hmm. certainly not in the last year or so so now I'm like intrigued by the whole thing and now this is maybe how the afternoon's gonna go but um so I wish you luck with the third book um I'm gonna have to I'll text you later to see how that's going (laughs) thank you (laughs) but um I love your writing I love to share it with everyone I tell everyone you gotta read this stuff um thank you and it was great talking to you and have a lovely Sunday you too I hope you get everything done that you have some time to relax as well (laughs) I hope so too. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see. Because, you know, school starts again tomorrow. So I got nothing. Like spring break just ended. So it's like back into the program. And they're going to shift maybe the in-person. I'm not sure. 
they, that's been a debate, but I'm going to have to figure out today, like if they're going to shift it, what's it's going to, what it's going to look like. Cause they were going to make a decision after spring break, depending on who told them that they traveled or whatever that is. So it's on the fly. <laughs> Everything is in the air. Every, every single thing. You just have to like roll with it. Deal with it. Oh man. I know. It's like, well, I have to buy food for like, if he needs a snack, but I have to buy food for if he's at home. Cause he won't eat the same food. I learned that during the pandemic. He's like, well, I want hot food. Why would I eat like cold food at home? And I was like, Oh, you have a point. <laughs> You have a point. Well, if I have to be next to the stove, I might as well eat hot food. Exactly. Exactly. So I decided to buy both today because I don't know what's going to happen this week even. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm just planning for all of the contingencies. But there may be – I may sneak some reading time in between planning for all the food contingencies for school. (laughs) Okay. Good. 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 Take care of yourself. Okay. You too. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. This has been A Time to Thrill with me, your host, author, Amy Austin. If you enjoyed it, I hope you'll share, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. It will help others to find and listen to my conversations with brilliant creators. Also, please hit the subscribe button on your podcast app. In addition to hosting this podcast, I'm also the author of the Casey Court series of legal thrillers. They're available wherever books are sold, your local library, and also an audiobook. You can follow me on Instagram at ThrillerPod, find me on Facebook at Casey Court Series, or A Time to Thrill. Thanks for listening, and I'll be back with you soon with more great conversations.